So the basis of life is a cell. And as hopefully you recall, there are two basic cell plans among living things. Uh, the prokaryotic cell plan, kind of like a floor plan, and the eukaryotic floor plan. Um, so those two uh, types of cells are the basis for all life. And so let's go on and look a little bit closer at the organisms that are made out of those types of cells and then one that isn't. So before we can start that, just a few definitions of words that you should know. And I start with this because when you look at the diversity of life, and that's really what we're looking at, all different kinds of living things and how they are related to one another, these words come up. The two words that I'm, I'm going to just discuss for a second are phylogeny and classification, so or taxonomy and taxonomy. So phylogeny refers to sort of the genetic tree of life, the family tree, who's related to who, um, who descended from who. And now most of that is based on uh, genomic testing of DNA sequences that can literally show single nucleotide or, or changes in genomes of organisms and, and put them onto a tree using um, very, very powerful machine learning uh, to do that. And so, you know, we, we have a pretty good understanding of how that tree works. And remember, you know, always keep in mind that it's not really a tree, it's a shrubbery. So phylogeny is the how genetically related organisms are to one another. So it really is that shrubbery or tree of life. And you know, recall also that um, the, the gene or genes, one of the key genes that is looked at in terms of the sequence of nucleotides in that gene is the gene for 16S ribosomal RNA for prokaryotes, uh, which is unique to prokaryotes. And then for eukaryotes, it's the 18S uh, ribosomal RNA. So remember those, both of those are part of the ribosomal RNAs themselves are part of the structure of the ribosome. The genes to make those ribosomal RNAs are found in the genomes of those organisms. And so, you know, now what we do is go fishing for those genes in particular, sequence them, and then allow computers to sort out, um, you know, the relationships between different living things. So with phylogeny, that's where the concept of trees comes from. This is, this is where we can build structures that look like this, um, where you know, there's a common ancestor, and over time, there are branch points where uh, mutation followed by natural selection uh, occur. So mutation occurs, natural selection says, oh, this is better for me, so I'm gonna go up this branch, or that was better um, for the environment I live in, so I'm gonna take this other route uh, and become you know, more diverse. And that's how diversity arises. So you know, originally cells were prokaryotic and over time now we have two different cell types and many different types of organisms within in each of those two groups. So, so kind of one thing when you're looking at these trees, um, this is considered a rooted tree. And what that means is that you know, it went up and out like the branches of a tree. Um, and so starting from that point, you know, what I wanted to show you is over evolutionary time, the further away those, these branch points are, it represents evolutionary time. So in other words, there are two distinct branches um, that separated this organism one into these two groups. And then notice again, there's another branch point here where we ended up with group A and group B separating from one another. So time-wise, um, these events, so to go from whatever the original cell was up to A and B was a, you know, could have been millions or even billions of years uh, to get there. So A and B are related to each other um, somewhat, but they are, different from one another in enough ways to make them distinct branches. And likewise here, so looking at it going on to this other branch, one branch point gave us uh, species E, the other branch point gave us species C and D. So looking at those aspects of it, you know, C and E are 
distantly related. They're related, but they're distantly related. But all of these are very distantly related from the others. So that's how you can interpret these uh, trees when you see them. And I'm pointing this out to you because we will be looking at phylogenetic trees as we you know, go further in this conversation and other conversations in microbiology. So that's phylogeny. And then the other one is taxonomy. And taxonomy has been around for a very long time. In fact, we can go back to Carolus Linnaeus who um, you know, decided that humans had to have a better understanding of life and we had to characterize it, we had to put it into groups and we had to name them. Um, so, you know, kind of like a, a library, if you will, of organisms. And then also realize that in Linnaeus's time, there were only two known types of living things. And those were the plants and the animals. Uh, because why? They were macroscopic. Humans could see them with their eyes because this was before the time of microscopes. And so Linnaeus, tried, he, based on observed characteristics, um, he you know, did his best and others have done their best to say, well, these are the general characteristics that all these things have similar, so we'll put them into the same general classification groups. So that's the idea of taxonomy. It's, it's more about classification. Um, and the, the groups themselves, it's a hierarchical grouping going from you know, the top uh, where things are sort of related would be the kingdoms. And now, you know, since for the past 30 years, we've realized that there are three overarching um, domains, what are referred to as domains, and then kingdoms, and then going down the uh, taxonomy through phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, with species being you know, pretty much uniform in terms of uh, how closely related there are, and then um, you know, kind of going back up that way. So for example, you know, humans, we'll take humans, are members of the eukarya domain. So what is the characteristic that distinguishes um, all eukarya, it's the fact that they are made out of eukaryotic cells. So that's us, but that's a lot of other things uh, as well that fall under that category. So we're distantly related to looking at it like that, you know, to plants, to worms, to slime molds, um, and then working our way down in the kingdoms, right? So that the kingdom would be the animal kingdom. So now we're doing away with the plants and the fungi and we're just gonna focus on the animals, but that still puts us in the same category as a tsetse fly. So working down into different phyla, to classes, to orders, to families, down to the genus. Our genus is Homo and our species is Sapiens. And at the moment, we are, at least at this moment in time, um, the only species of Homo or humans on Earth. Uh, all the other uh, species that had come before are no longer with us. Uh, we seem to be a shining star at the moment, but realize that this is evolution and uh, you know, somebody will come along and take our place eventually too, probably. But that's a long time from now, so let's not worry about that. Okay, so um, just again, looking at our three overarching domains, I mentioned uh, that bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotic cells, right? So these are domains that consist of organisms that are prokaryotic unicellular, no nucleus. Um, and because of that, um, that, when you go through the taxonomy, bacteria and archaea, they skip the kingdoms and go right to the phyla. So really, it's only within the eukarya domain that kingdoms are even applicable, right? So the kingdoms in the eukarya are the plants and the animals and the fungi and the protists. Um, and then again, we have within the bacteria and archaea, they are domains and then go directly to phyla. So this is probably too much information, but one thing I wanted to get to was that, um, you know, Carolus Linnaeus not only gave us this system of grouping, he also gave us a system of naming, which was called the scientific nomenclature. So not only are all living things placed into groups, they are also named according to this convention. So this is the convention, and why am I bringing this up? Because when it comes to bacteria, so if you are interested in microbiology, you probably have figured out that mostly we talk about them, you know, we don't call them dogs and cats, we, ha we call them by their scientific names. And their names are sometimes weird and complicated because they are often derived from 
Latin or their variations of people's names. So, uh, you know, I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what that convention is. So as you're reading your textbook, as you're reading the articles that I'm having you read, uh, you will understand, you know, when you come across these words, and is I have no idea what that word is, look at it, and you're going to be able to tell if it's a scientific name or something, which hopefully will help. Okay, so the naming system is based on, uh, again, that taxonomy, where the names are based on the genus and the species. So they, the genus name of an organism is typically a noun or a formal noun, right, named after somebody or a descriptive term, a, a name of, of something. And then the species name is usually some kind of an adjective. So it's descriptive of the characteristic of the cell or what it does or where it lives, that kind of thing. Um, and like I said, back in the day, um, not, it's, I mean, this is still the convention, a lot of those words were Latin terms, right? As, it, as is true in medicine, um, you know, the, the, all that Latin terminology still shines through um, today. So here's the convention that we use for writing scientific names. Um, saying them is a whole nother story, but we won't even go there. When you write a scientific name of an organism, this is the convention. So the name of the genus, in other words, the first name of the organism, should be written with a capital letter. And the second name, the species name, is entirely lowercase. And that poses a problem sometimes because, you know, it's not like, your name or my name, our formal names are both capitalized. Only the genus name is capitalized. Species is lowercase, completely lowercase. So both names are italicized. Sometimes they're underlined depending on what is available and how old the, um, you know, how old it is the thing that you're reading because in the old days, everything was underlined as opposed to italicized. But what's the point of doing that? And that's to enable you to realize that, well, Here's this weird word or two weird words. I don't know what they are. They look like they're Latin and they're italicized. So guess what? That means they're the name of an organism. They're the name of, of some kind of um, living thing, which, like I said, a lot of times, you know, they don't refer to dogs and cats and bats and, um, you know, plants in this way. It's usually when it comes to microorganisms that the scientific names are used uh, routinely. So look for the, for the, italicized, uh, being, the words being italicized and then realize that sometimes um, to, because when you start looking at these scientific names, they're, you know, really long, um, a system of abbreviations has uh, come into common use. And so the abbreviation system is to use the first letter of the genus name, period, followed by the entire uh, species name. Okay, so that would be like abbreviating the first letter of your name followed by your last name. One exception is that your last name would not be written in a capital. So here's a couple of examples. These are bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, Bacillus cereus. So this is the genus name, Staphylococcus. Aureus is the species name. And for those of you who are dying to know what that means, this is, again, this is not a formal noun, so that's not named after somebody named Staphylococcus. This actually refers to the appearance of the cell. So, coccus is a term in Latin that refers to round or spherical. Staphylo refers to clusters. So, interestingly enough, you know, these cells, the, when you look at them under the microscope, guess what? They're clusters of circular shaped cells. So, the genus name is descriptive of that feature. And aureus, uh, this is a species name. So there are 30 some odd different species of Staphylococcus. And aureus is one of them. And if you remember back to your chemistry days where there is an element that is abbreviated AU because it is aureum, and that would be gold. And uh, that's because these bacteria produce a goldenish colored colony. Um, and that's where the, the species name came from. So Staphylococcus aureus is abbreviated S. aureus. Bacillus cereus. So bacillus refers to the shape of the bacterial cells. Um, cereus refers to a lot of things, but the point is when you abbreviate it, it comes out B. cereus, which is really cute, and that's why I put it in there. 
Uh, another example that everybody's familiar with, Escherichia coli. So Escherichia is the gentleman, uh, Escherichia, who was working with bacteria back in the golden age and was working with bacteria found in a fecal environment, let's just put it that way. And um, so as a result, when this bacteria was discovered, it was named after him specifically. So it's Escherichia, which is in honor of him, and then uh, coli, which is Latin for digestive tract or, or colon. So that's where that name comes from. Okay, so you're probably wondering, why did we just spend five minutes talking about that? And, and here's why, okay? This is why it matters to microbiologists and why I'm bringing it up. So this is an article that was published in the New York Times in um, 1999, uh, September 20th. And in fact, it was about an outbreak of a GI tract illness that occurred at the Washington County Fair up here in upstate New York. And um, at the time, it was, uh, it, there was, this outbreak was directly traced back to people who had attended um, the fair during certain days uh, during that, that fair season, which was early September of 1999. And so read the, just reading the, the headline, this was in the New York Times, okay? A deadly germ taints a tradition. E. coli devastates a family and leaves a fair in doubt. So, if you'd never, ever, ever heard of E. coli before, and I know that's a, you know, a long shot, most people have heard of E. coli, but if you've never heard of it before and you read this, which of these conclusions is correct? So what was the cause of this deadly germ? You know, what is the deadly germ? And then looking at the way they wrote the name of the organism, they don't tell you what the genus is, and they capitalized the second name. So does that mean that Elmo Coli, who was the guy working in the back room and went to the well and you know, got the water to make the coffee, is he the guy? Is he the germ? Is he the bad thing that, that led to all of this? Or was it, you know, there's a protozoan, which is uh, actually it's an amoeba uh, that can also cause GI tract illnesses. The name of that amoeba is Entamoeba coli. Entamoeba is a, is a eukaryotic organism in the protist group, in the protist kingdom. So it's about as far away from bacteria as uh, you, know, you could get. Or was it the bacteria Escherichia coli? And actually, to take it one step further, the answer, of course, is C. It was the bacteria Escherichia coli. And it wasn't the general type of E. coli. It was a type that was Escherichia coli 0157H7, which is a strain designation for that bacteria, which had acquired superpowers from some of its more toxic friends in the form of germs that it acquired through horizontal gene transfer, which gave it the ability to become deadly. So it is one strain of a very broad grouping, ubiquitous group of microbes, most of which are not bad guys, are not deadly germs, and are not evil. But when you read this headline, everybody immediately said, oh, E. coli, whenever you say E. coli, people back up three steps because they assume that it's something, it's this, as opposed to the 99.9% .9 of all E. coli that are just out there making a living like everybody else. So this is why it kind of matters, and this is why I wanted to just bring all that up for you so that you would be able to recognize um, when they're talking about the scientific name of an organism, in particular, a microorganism. So looking at um, various classification schemes, various types of taxonomy and phylogeny, I mean, taxonomy was something that occurred until the genetic era, which started probably in the 1980s, 1990s, up to the present. Um, but you'll notice that the taxonomy, it has evolved over the years, just as, you know, life evolves. So the changes in the taxonomy reflect uh, improvements in our scientific ability to investigate life at this level, right, at their genes. So here's our friend, Carolus Linnaeus, and, you know, basically just those two, two branches off the tree of life, the animals and the plants, because Microbes were at this point still not really acknowledged as being a form of life until Pasteur came along and said, yep, they're living things, they're cells, they come from other cells also. 
Um, and then in you know the mid 1800s, um, at about the time of the golden age of microbiology, those microscopic life forms got credit. Um, so Haeckel put them in, you know, added two groups to the tree, which are the Monera, which is the older term for all bacteria, right? All prokaryotes fell under the um, kingdom name of Monera. And then the protists, which at the time included every other microscopic element that wasn't a bacteria. And then moving ahead to 69, uh, Robert Whitaker added um, this branch, the fungi, which includes um, molds and yeasts and a few other things. Uh, notice it's, it's higher up the tree. So, you know, the Monera being the most ancient, then came the single-celled eukaryotes, then came the multicellular eukaryotes. So single-cell eukaryote up to, um, you know, going off in two different directions with fungi and plants. So again, these are rooted trees and you can see how they evolved. And then come 1977, when DNA sequencing was at that point um, something that was done routinely, it was becoming more widely known. Geneticists were studying genes uh, of organisms to more detail, so, and, and just looking at genes. Carl Woese uh, discovered that there were actually three groupings of life according to what's in the DNA of the organism, not how they appeared, because all of these other um, taxonomy schemes were how uh, based on direct observations and created at this point some of them were microscopic observations um, and there was you know metabolic properties in there too in other words all phenotypic uh, at this point life is because this now we have phylogeny where life is analyzed at the genotypic level I mean the level of the genes and so this is what would be considered an unrooted tree, meaning it isn't like a tree going like this. It's like uh, life went three ways. It's like, yep, I'm, you know, that's it. I'm going my way, you go your way. Um, and, and this is, and again, with all the interactions of genes that have happened along the way into these three basic branches. So Carl Woese um, posited at that point that there were three domains that superseded kingdoms and within about five, six, uh, probably about seven years, uh, this became uh, more widely accepted, but realized that in his three domain view of what life looked like, uh, two of those domains were actually prokaryotic. So these are domains that consist of prokaryotic cells. Uh, they are bacteria, in other words, but they are very, very distinct from one another, as distinct from each other as each one of them is from eukarya. And now our conventional thinking is that um, in this tree of life that the archaea are kind of on the branch, if you will, leading up to the evolution of eukaryotes, which is something that your reading, the reading that you um, will be doing should help to clarify as well. Okay, so we're gonna look at, um, you know, all of these different branches, just a kind of a close up quick view of what is in each of them. Um, starting with the uh, bacteria, which just happens to be my favorite branch. So, you know, this is a, a good overview, a broad overview. I'm gonna show you a more detailed picture of this in a second. Um, but this one kind of shows how, uh, you know, bacteria, the, the main branches, and I just wanna focus in on a few of these because these are the ones that, you know, are associated with humans that we, that impact humans. Um, the ones that you might encounter, the ones that are playing a direct role in uh, your daily existence. Not that the others don't as well, but these are the major groups that I'd like to focus on. So uh, looking across these different branches, there are the so-called firmicutes. Um, the firmicutes are types of bacteria that have a type of cell wall called a gram-positive cell wall, which we discussed um, what that means uh, previously. So they have that gram-positive uh, cell wall. That's what they all have in common. And then, of course, from that point forward, there is a good deal of diversity. So um, the firmicutes, there they are right there on this tree. Um, they have on uh, trees that that are more rooted trees, you can see that they are pretty ancient. So they uh, go back quite a ways. 
I, I will give a shout out to these guys over here. These are called the deeply branching um, bacteria because they are the ones that seem to show up first when you look at the tree version of life. Uh, they are they're ancient and they tend to be in environments that we, you know, humans don't can't survive in and don't go in all that often. With a couple of exceptions, uh, not the least of which are these, the bacteroides, which I'll get to in a second. Okay, so there's the Firmicutes, gram positive cell wall. Then I also want to point out there are the actinobacteria, which also have a gram positive cell wall mostly, um, but they are genetically distinct, meaning their DNA is, is very different um, in terms of, uh, well, specifically the content of two nucleotides with guanine and cytosine in them. So they're called the G plus C rich uh, group because their DNA is loaded with these two, or more loaded with these two nucleotides than other groups. So that makes them distinct. They also have other properties. Uh, many are filamentous, many produce antibiotics. Um, they live, you know, they're, they're very widely known in um, terrestrial and aquatic environments. They're also associated with humans. Uh, so we might find those um, on human skin, for example, or other places. And some are known to be disease causing in humans and animals. So that's these guys right there. And then the third group are the proteobacteria. And you notice as you go along the tree, Proteobacteria tend to be a little bit more modern, you know, so in other words, they came into being a little bit later than these other groups. Um, there are five subgroups, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, so there's five of them, plus zeta. So I guess they've decided that, you know, we've gone A, B, C, D, E, all the way to Z, so maybe they think that's it in terms of how many groups there are. Um, so just a, a few words about these. The alpha proteobacteria are going to be very interesting to you. They are intracellular uh, bacteria. In other words, they grow inside of other types of bacterial cells. Many of them cause, can cause human diseases. And it is believed, the hypothesis at the moment, is that mitochondria, yep, those organelles that are found inside of our cells, are... Um, you know, descendants, if you will, of the alpha branch of the proteobacteria, right? So what they all have in common is that they have a gram-negative type of cell wall and then other features that go along with that. So um, there are many uh, bacteria, uh, our gut microbiome, for example, has many proteobacteria, different types of proteobacteria in it, um, very broad group of organisms and you can see them right here. And there's a little branch leading to the mitochondria. And then the bacteroides, which you can see right here, again, way, way back. These are anaerobic bacteria. They're gram-negative bacteria. Um, you know, I, they, it's one of those bacteria that um, in the clinical laboratory, they used to try to culture because it was believed they were just strictly associated with disease. And now it's pretty clear that they are a major component of the human gut microbiome. Um, the bacteria that live in our gut that keep us healthy. It's the balance of bacteroides that seems to play a very important role, especially when it comes to immune system function. So that will be something we'll discuss later on. And then also the cyanobacteria, that's these guys here. These are photosynthetic types of bacteria. So they live in uh, terrestrial and aquatic environments, very broad group. Because they're photosynthetics, they're major, major players in the um, biogeo cycles um, that have to do with recycling of oxygen and CO2. Um, and it is, notice here, the little branch of chloroplasts goes off from the cyanobacteria. So chloroplasts, yes, those organelles found in plant cells that um, perform the energy converting steps um, necessary for photosynthesis are related to the cyanobacteria, genetically related and other characteristics as well. So, and again, that's where there's all that crossover between bacteria and eukarya as we look at them from the perspective of genes, not just features. Okay, so isn't that pretty? Looks really nice, very uncomplicated. And then, but I gotta show you this, okay? 
So this is a more modern version of the uh, of an unrooted tree of life, which this little orange dot right here represents um, those origins. And again, you know, each of the groups going in different directions. So here are the bacteria, the bacteria domain. Here's the archaea domain, and then notice the eukarya. But notice in this tree that the the bacteria, right, are closest to our origin cells, and then over time the archaea, which are also prokaryotic, evolved. And then notice, you know, so this line, this this branch, if you will, leading to the eukaryotes, which includes us, uh, goes through the the archaea. So we're going to talk about, a little bit more about those in a second. But as I mentioned, it is sort of, at this point the hypothesis is that it is the archaea that are on the branch to evolution of eukaryotes um, more so than the bacteria. Because the bacteria are just off, they're just on their own little branch doing their own little thing. But here's the cool part. So, you know, since we have been able, all the new technologies available, sequencing technologies, rapid throughput, and then um, computing power, gave scientists the ability and, and you know to pull out those genes and sequence them and do this kind of um, networking you know looking at light looking at those differences more clearly and as a result of doing that um, this paper published you know a few years ago showed that there is a completely separate grouping which is probably a subgroup of the bacteria or it might be its own group called the candidate phyla radiation, which I'm going to abbreviate CPR, right? So the CPR, which notice the, the significance of this paper when it was published is that, oh, look, it's a whole new branch of life. You know, one that we, you know, we just had it kind of had them lumped in with the bacteria. So here's our bacteria, our eukarya, and eukarya. And now that we can go hunting for just genes and we have better ways to do that, we find this whole separate branch um, and quite a number, a large number of, of group, subgroupings of them. And it turns out, you know, it, it doubles the size of bacteria. So notice that in the, at least in our present day iteration, in the realm of life, there are bacteria is huge. So archaea are big, eukarya is little, right? So it goes from the world being mostly bacteria and then there are also these archaea, and then there's, you know, later on came the eukaryotes. So I don't know how you feel about that. I think it's very cool. But nonetheless, right, it's a bit like, I like this last quote, it's a bit like discovering that we've missed half the stars in the Milky Way when it, came, when it comes to this level of scientific discoveries, right? This is on par with Carl Woe saying, whoops, actually, there's this whole other branch of life we've never known before called the, and I'm going to call it the archaea. So now we also have the CPR. And so then moving on to looking more closely at the archaea. So we have, again, there's the bacteria, here's the CPR. Moving down the group, um, these are even more recent uh, discoveries in terms of our evolutionary lineages. So notice that we have, we're going to add uh, the DPN archaea and the Asgard archaea. So that's kind of like the older and the newer. And the Asgard genome encode eukaryotic systems. So it, it sort of makes it look like the eukaryotes are actually a branch of archaea from this Asgard group. And just to kind of give you an indication of this Asgard group, um, you know, so the Asgard name is not uh, without reference. So notice this superphylum of archaea uh, has subgroupings called Loki archaeota, the Thor archaeota, and Odin archaeota, meaning, you know, um, these, these are the, the Greek gods that looked after humans. And that's what these are named after, okay? So what does that mean? You know, so, oh my God, now we have, you know, we have a golden age where we figured out that some bacteria cause diseases. 
And what is the role of all these new living things that we had never realized were even in existence when it comes to human health and disease? And actually the, the health of our entire ecosystem, like the entire earth, right? Um, since these are so ubiquitous and so present and responsible for giving rise to eukaryotic life as we know it, what are they doing? So that was, you know, the, the fact that the um, Asgard archaea were, are on that branch to evolution. And by the way, this is all disputed. So people are going to be fighting over this for another 10 years. But what is the medical significance of these new branches of life? And the answer is we have no idea. And so just kind of looking now that we have the tools to go hunting for them, um, they have found certain members, sub members of these groups to be associated with uh, dermatitis. Others are associated with cystic fibrosis. Um, they have found this one group, TM7, they can modulate our immune response. Now, what I can tell you is to be able to modulate the human immune response means coevolution, that they've been there for a really long time. They've been, just haven't been noted because we didn't have the tools or the technology that allowed us to actually see it. So, Again, another group, the Wos archaeota, named after, of course, Carl Wos, they were detected in the lungs of human cell-free DNA of certain um, other types of bacteria were found in the blood of human subjects. Um, they're abundant in groundwater and are ingested regularly by humans and animals. So stay tuned because we don't know what any of this means in terms of uh, health and disease, but I have to believe that um, anything that can modulate our immune response since we have so little understanding of the basis of autoimmune diseases, this might be something that plays a role in that. So that's the, the shrubbery, the, the tree of life We're up to the moment in terms of what we know and what we've added to it uh, over the course of years. So we've added a whole ton, the you know, take home lesson here, we've added a whole ton of bacteria to our understanding of the different groups of life. So when it comes to looking at this from the perspective of humans, um, you know, this is, we are in the age of the microbiome. The age of the microbiome, I think, started probably around 2005 when it became apparent that, you know, we humans had more uh, genes and gene functions than we actually had genes in our own DNA. And the DNA, therefore, had to be coming from somewhere and it comes from all the microbes that inhabit us. So this is just a fun infographic uh, that shares that information. And I do want to tell you that a lot of the human microbiome research is about the gut microbiome because they're those samples where we are detecting these microbes and studying them um, is one of the easiest to obtain from a human. It doesn't require biopsy. It doesn't require too much, uh, drawing blood or any kind of invasive procedure. It requires humans pooping in a box and sending it in um, for analysis. So we do, we, you know, of all the parts of our anatomy, the gut is the one that we're gathering information very rapidly with regard to what microbes are present and what microbial genes are uh, present also. But every part of the human body has a microbiome. Right? And so notice this list of bacteria, um, the actinobacteria, the permicutes, the bacteroides, proteobacteria, this one that I didn't mention previously, but are important, the fusobacteria. Notice that in different parts of our body, um, the proportion of these bacteria differ. And this would be um, in a, you know, uh, what's, what would be considered a healthy human providing uh, samples. So, you know, for example, in the large intestine, notice uh, that would be the colon. Uh, large intestine is different than the small intestine, right? So small intestine, what comes out, here's your stomach. So your digestive tract goes from your mouth to your esophagus, to your stomach, to small intestine, to large intestine. Notice how the diversity changes. Notice that the different species of bacteria um, that are found, or different groupings of bacteria that are found, and this shows relative proportions of those um, microbes, right? So the mouth has um, mostly Firmicutes, which are those gram-positive bacteria, with a spattering of bacteroides and proteobacteria, 
whereas the esophagus has far more firmicutes, so does the stomach, uh, than other groups. But then when you get down to the small intestine, notice the proteobacteria, the gram-negative bacteria take over. And then when you get down into the colon, the bacteroides become more prominent. So why does that occur? Obviously because this microbiome, we have had these microbes as part of our um, ecosystem, as part of the human ecosystem for as long as there have been humans. Uh, and they are doing the chemical and metabolic things that are necessary for not only for them to survive in those environments, but for us to recognize the merit and not try to kill them. In other words, come to a symbiotic um, state where we're all kind of in it together, right? So you can see, look, you know, going around to skin, skin is perhaps one of the most diverse in terms of different types of bacteria that are present. But notice the majority are those actinobacteria and firmicutes are the two that are most commonly present on uh, human skin, among other areas. So the human microbiome, you know, where I feel that we're fortunate to live in this area, era where we're finding out so much more about this. But once again, we don't know what it means um, in terms of health and disease uh, that these you know, the, we do know that there are differences in the state of the microbiome between healthy individuals and people with various disease states. And the number of disease states this is associated with has been growing rapidly. Uh, so it's an interesting time to be a microbiologist and hopefully medicine will be paying attention to this as well because there are um, ideas in here that, you know, medicine is mostly worried about germs and infectious diseases and things along those lines when in fact you know to the expense if you will of the good guys who are there trying to help us in the long run so that's the bacteria and then moving on to uh the eukarya so again in the eukarya domain remember we have our five kingdoms the plants the animals those are the two higher Grouping, so in other words, the furthest away, um, and then also the fungi and the protists. So in the traditional tree of life, um, you know, a the the prokaryotic cell evolved into a single-celled eukaryote, which then they decided to start hanging together and uh, gave rise to all the multicellular eukaryotes. So, what, but the one thing that all four of those kingdoms have in common is that the cells of those organisms are eukaryotic in floor plan, right? So they have the eukaryotic design, not all exactly the same. Um, they include mitochondria and the photosynthetic ones include chloroplasts, which remember are actually, you know, everybody likes to say descendants of bacteria, but you know, my thought is, look at they're autonomous why aren't they just endosymbiotic bacteria? Why are they descendants of bacteria when in fact they're doing what they're doing, they're just doing it inside of other cells permanently as their full-time job. Okay, so looking at, of course, this is a course in microbiology, so we'll kind of emphasize the micro eukaryotes. Again, starting at the single cell versions of those, which are the protozoa, um, some types, some algae are actually uh, single celled microscopic. Um, and then some fungi, for example, yeasts are unicellular, um, but other fungi in that grouping, the molds um, and other fungi can be multicellular, uh, but they the cells are not as diversified in function as that of you know the plants and the animals. Let's just put it that way. And then again, some micro eukaryotes are studied in microbiology because they do cause diseases. So the microbiology of infectious diseases, if you took a course in that or medical microbiology, you'd be talking about ciliates, uh, the ciliated microbes, because some of them cause diseases. Amoebas, um, giardia, for example, in our area in the Adirondacks, giardia can be an issue because if you, uh, it lives in water um, and in fecal material, and if you happen to ingest water contaminated with fecal material, um, giardia can actually infect you and cause a GI illness. That is very difficult to recognize and treat, turns out. Um, the group called the apicomplexans, which have a very complex life cycle, 
uh, to begin with, among other things, are some of the more notorious causers of human diseases, like for example, malaria. Malaria is a, a problem, a major problem in other countries of the world, particularly ones uh, that are underdeveloped and also the, the warm and humid climates where, there, where mosquitoes abound because they are transmitted by mosquitoes. Same with Chagas disease. Toxoplasmosis, again, another type of protozoa, um, you know, the, these AP complexins, and babesiosis, which is a, a tick-borne type of microbe, uh, of, of protozoa that's found in, in our area, actually. So they are causes of significant human morbidity, meaning sickness, and are studied as a result of that. So that with, you know, just kind of keeping that in mind, we've talked about the human microbiome, meaning all of the humans' bacterial inhabitants, of which we know lots and lots and lots, thanks to the, um, you know, the, the research that started in 2004 or five, looking at trying to grab those bacteria and finding what they were. So we know a lot about them. But I do want to point out that when it comes to eukaryotic microbes, there is a human mycobiome as well, um, which means that part of your, you know, your whole being includes fungi. It includes mold and it includes yeasts. So notice, you know, what we know, you know, the there hasn't been a lot of research on this topic yet because the major focus is on the bacteria. Um, but looking at the microbiome, right, so these different areas have been investigated. And what's kind of interesting about the microbiome is when you look down this list of, uh, these are the names of different organisms, for example, in the oral cavity, Alternaria, Aspergillus, Candida, 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 Candida. So maybe you recognize the name of Candida because it is a yeast that is known to cause infections. It causes vaginal infections, it can cause skin infections, it causes thrush. So we know it as a cause of disease, but it's also part of the human mycobiome, meaning they're there. So they're there, they're part of the realm of things. And when, the, when Candida, for example, steps up to be a disease causer, is when the microbiome, in other words, the bacterial inhabitants, break down and don't do their job. So when the balance of, of the normal microbiome gets out of whack, when dysbiosis occurs, that's when members of the microbiome step up and see it as their big opportunity uh, to, you know, now that all the, the other guys are busy fighting with each other, they can step up and kind of take control for a period of time. So that's what most of these um, are, are known about, right? Aspergillus is another one that is well known to cause um, different kinds of diseases. So just wanted to keep that on the radar that, you know, we, and even in microbiology, I will admit it, I'm a bit of a, you know, a cheerleader for the bacteria, um, for the prokaryotes, uh, but these unicellular eukaryotes are, equally important when it comes to ecosystem health, which is what we need to look at going forward in, these, in any of these fields. Okay, so just when you thought it was easy and simple, let's look at viruses. Okay, so where do they fit in? We talk about phylogeny, we talk about taxonomy, where do viruses fit in? And the answer is, that's a really good question. Nobody, knows exactly. At the moment, you know, here's our, our, our shrubbery of life, if you will, our unrooted tree showing our three branches, which, you know, actually is four branches and probably more than that. But, you know, viruses at the moment are kind of over there. They're uh, not considered to be on any of these branches. And the reason why is because their genes are not, their, their, their genomes are not the same as ours. And in fact, they're not cellular. So that gives us another whole problem because, wait a minute, life is based on cells, remember? So viruses are complicated um, and we'll just leave it as that because it turns out, you know, you can study something without having to include it into the classification systems that exist. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff we do know about viruses. There's a lot of stuff we don't know about viruses. 
um, like for example, where did they come from? Who came first, <laughs> right? Were cells here before viruses or are viruses here first waiting for cells to be invented? So there's a lot of stuff that we will probably never be able to answer, but interesting nonetheless. So if you recall when going back and saying, all right, so what is life? Um, you know, there was the cellular and then the acellular. So these are, viruses are acellular. So what does that mean? They are not made of cells. So then you gotta go back to what it was, the, the definition of what a cell was, um, meaning they, you know, they don't have a cell membrane, they don't have the ability to metabolize, they don't have the ability to reproduce on their own. Okay, so in other words, a, a virus, like these things floating around here, which I just like this because, you know, right now as you're looking at this picture, you can't see them because you know they're too tiny to be seen but this is your this is probably what if you were able to see viruses if that was your superpower you'd see them all over the place and they're inert in this form they're just kind of like yep here i am it's only when they attach invade other cells or cells that they become alive, if you will, because at that point, they take over the cell. They take over the genome and the um, biosynthesis machinery of the cell and force that cell to produce more viruses. So technically, they're not cells. They're not metabolizing on their own. So in other words, they don't have to eat food and produce ATP in order to do this all themselves. What they do is invade a cell and have them do it for them. So is that alive or is that not alive? I don't know. I think it's pretty clever, but you know, biologists will be debating this for another 10 to 20 years and trying to decide what it is. So regardless of whether or not it is a form of life, it certainly, viruses certainly affect life um, in many, many ways, including on the genomic level, which you'll see in a second. So, you know, um, viruses, the virusoids or viroids as they're called. Uh, I also mentioned satellites, which are just nucleic acids. Prions, which are just proteins, um, have these capabilities. So they're not cell, but they are infectious and they certainly impact humans and other ecosystems profoundly. So uh, just leave it right there for you to decide how you feel about whether viruses are alive or not. So that said, talking about uh, what we know about viruses, so the, they have structure. So they're not cells, but they have structures. And the, there's variation in structures, just like on the cells, there are the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, there are different cell virus floor plans also, different viral floor plans. So starting at the level of their genome, they do have a genome. So cells, I mean, all life on earth has a genome made out of DNA. Um, many viruses do, but many viruses also have genes that are made out of RNA. And so that's interesting because remembering back to your basic biology, when we talk about DNA and RNA, you know, DNA is this exquisitely stable molecule um, that was designed because it has to hold the genome and we don't want the genome to change too much because you know We want the species to go on um, You know RNA viruses are just like eh, I don't care about the species. I don't want to change I want to change with the times I want to get done whatever I got to get done and so they built their genes out of these shorter lived less stable molecules um, that are made out of ribonucleic acid instead of deoxyribonucleic acid. So that's one interesting feature about viruses that makes them distinct from cells. So remember, one of the hallmark features of cells is they're surrounded by a cell membrane. Um, viruses don't have a cell membrane, but they do have a capsid. So the capsid is uh, made out of protein molecules called capsomeres, and often the, the proteins are of the same type, but they don't have to be. They can be of different types. Uh, but nonetheless, it forms a shell, if you will, a protein shell around the genome. So you've got the genome and you've got the shell. And that's the basic core structure that I'm not going to say all viruses because I don't believe that, but probably the majority of them have. 
Um, and some of them, that is the only structure of the virus. Those are referred to as naked or non-enveloped viruses. So it's just the genome and it's just a capsid. So then some are surrounded by uh, another structure called an envelope. Now here's the fun part. Envelopes are membranes. <laughs> Not a cell membrane, it's a viral envelope. Um, even though they're often phospholipid bilayers, but they're, they can be embedded with various other types of surface proteins and other things um, that makes them distinctively different from cell membranes. But an envelope virus often steals the membrane, wraps itself up in the membrane of the host cell that it's invading. So it's not making the cell membrane, it's stealing the membrane from a cell. Okay? So technically it's not being constructed by the virus, it's just being, I never, I don't want to use the word borrowed because the cell ain't going to get it back. It's being um, absconded with, uh, taken away from the cell that those viruses invade. And then again, notice that in this case, at least, many have uh, these surface molecules uh, that are referred to just generically as spikes because they stick out from um, the envelope or from the capsid. Okay, so those are the, you know, the basic, basic structure. Uh, some are enveloped. And this is a, a major difference between different types of viruses too. So in addition to having different genomes, there is the idea that some are enveloped and some are not. And as a microbiologist, um, I would be uh, lapse if I didn't mention bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are viruses that infect bacteria. And honestly, these were probably the first viruses ever investigated because it was noted that when you grew bacteria in culture, depending on the bacteria, sometimes it looked like the culture was being eaten by something. And that's where they got their name from because phage means to eat. So these were bacteria eaters. And then once the technology was available to recognize that they were actually some microscopic um, entities that, and they were uh, viruses, they still carry the name phage. But so phage refers to viruses that infect bacteria and viruses is a term used for everybody else. So just so you know, when you see this word bacteriophage, it's referring specifically to viruses that infect bacteria. So here's the fun thing, you know, our, we are colonized by bazillions of bacterial cells, all of which are carrying these bacteriophage. Well, maybe not all of them, but lots of them are. Um, so in that regard, we're kind of colonized by these bacteriophage as well. So they're part of our ecosystem as well as uh, the bacteria that they are inhabiting. So this is a representative diagram of a bacteriophage. And notice how unique it looks. Um, so it, it almost looks like some kind of spaceship or outer space alien, uh, it, very sophisticated in design for something that, it, you know, is just a bunch of molecules that came together in a specific way. So shout out to physics because that's how these things happen. Like physical forces create these structures, but whoa, I mean, nature did an amazing job when it came to these viruses that infect bacteria. When you look at viruses that infect other groups of living things, um, they tend to have characteristic shapes, but they are, there's a great deal of shape diversity. But you know, just looking at it generally, most viruses have distinctive shapes that you can see when you use an electron microscope to view them, or you can create computer-generated models if you know what their molecules are. So for example, um, this is something called a helical form. Right here, so the capsid is a helical, so the protein molecules are wrapped up in a tube. Um, so that the, the genome is inside that tube. This is something called an icosahedron, which if you remember your geometry, you probably, even if you remember geometry, you don't remember the term icosahedron because there's 20 sides, right? So pentagon, yeah, I remember that, and hexagon. Um, but this, uh, this polyhedral or icosahedral shape is think about a diamond, okay? So it has many different facets to it. And um, very distinctive design there. And then there is the complex or, you know, the ones that are wrapped up in envelopes. 
The envelope, remember, is a membrane, so it's very wavy, wobbly. Um, often they appear as round or they could appear as, uh, you know, complex in shape, meaning they don't have a, like a definite shape. These two, you can see the tube-like structure here on the tobacco mosaic virus. That's a helical capsid. You can see the icosahedral shape, right, this very geometric design um, for these types of viruses. But for others, it, you know, they just kind of look, you know, blobby is the best way of putting it. So those are the are three general um, types of viral shapes. And when it comes to how viruses go about making more viruses, all right, and then the question is, all right, is this reproduction? I'm sure the virus thinks it is. Um, just because humans don't doesn't really matter much to what the virus does. I guess it's kind of like a replicating um, feature. So it's what this what viruses are able to do is to invade cells, right, their host cell, um, they enter that host cell, and then they take it over, right? So because they have a genome, they have their own set of genes, once the genes get into the host cell, the host cell says, okay, so I know what to do with this. This is DNA. I know what to do with this. I make messenger RNA, and then I make protein. Or if the genome happens to be RNA, the host cell says, okay, I know what to do with that. I make proteins with that, so I'm going to make proteins. Some of those are enzymes that actually go back and destroy the host cell's genome. So it's a brilliant design, uh, regardless of whether they're living or not. It certainly has allowed viruses to, you know, make quite the um, impact, if you will, on all of the things that they invade and infect. And just to realize that every type of cell that we know of has its own sets of viruses, right? So there are viruses that infect humans. There are viruses that infect dogs and cats. There are viruses that infect bats. There are viruses that infect plants. There are viruses that infect fungi. There are viruses that infect algae. There are viruses that infect bacteria. So I guess the question is, are there viruses that infect viruses? Now that's a question to be answered by somebody, hopefully down the line. Okay, so just looking at their basic process, so the virus attaches to a host cell because they have very, those spikes um, or the surfaces match up so they are able to come together. For whatever reason, the host cell decides to take this virus into itself, into its cytoplasm. So it is tricked, if you will, into doing that, or um, again, acts of physics. In the case of bacteriophage, they can actually inject their DNA uh, into the genome or into the cytoplasm of the bacterial cells through that assembly. If you notice that very complex structure, it's like a hypodermic needle. Uh, so they can inject their genomes into the cells that they uh, infect. But regardless, their genes get into the cytoplasm of the cell. From there, the genes need to, uh, if it's DNA, the gene has to be transported into the nucleus. If it's RNA, other things have to happen in the cytoplasm, such as uh, translation, such as um, replication of the RNA genome uh, or reverse transcription of the RNA genome back to DNA. And all of that occurs, but the point being, the virus knows how to make the right molecules that the cell can act on. So the cell will use viral RNAs to make proteins from. The cell will use um, the viral RNA as a template to make DNA from, all of which is housed within the machinery of the host cell. So because the virus puts its genes, its genome into the host, and the genome of the virus is able to overcome the genome of the host. The ultimate end game is that uh, viral particles, viral proteins, viral nucleic acids are produced by the host cell, which then self-assemble into a, a viral particle, into a, a viable particle, which then gets released from the host cell to go off and invade other types of host cells. So. 
maybe not cellular reproduction the way we have been studying it for all these years, but it certainly is reproducing the virus. So it is a way for the virus to make more of itself and perpetuate its own species. Isn't that what reproduction is supposed to be all about, okay? So um, what I wanna tell you is that viral, all of these processes are diverse and complicated. Um, and so even the debate over whether or not, you know, how to classify and consider viruses is still um, under concern and under debate by biologists, right? Other people don't really care so much. So, you know, the question is, how do you classify something that isn't alive? One way is to say it's not alive, it's a particle. So here are the features of the particles. That is the basis for the Baltimore classification of viruses. Baltimore refers to David Baltimore, a famous virologist, not the city. Um, so he came up with a system where he said, all right, look it. There are two basic uh, types of genomes. There are DNA viruses and there are RNA viruses. And even though those nucleic acids, um, you know, there are two nucleic acids, they actually can have different forms. So that gives uh, these seven categories, these seven categories or groups based on the construct, if you will, how the, the genome, um, the genes of the virus are made. So notice group one has a genome made out of double-stranded DNA. Group one viruses, which includes human herpes viruses, for example, um, they, are, they have genes that are just like our genes. So all they have to do is get their genes into our cells and our cells treat their genes as if they were our own. Okay, so it's, they're directly translated into messenger RNA. They can be replicated by our DNA replication machinery to make new genomes. Um, here's group two. The genes are made out of single-stranded DNA, which is another like, wait a minute moment, because again, nature designed double-stranded DNA because it's very stable, very resilient, hard to destroy, stays around in nature for millions of years. Single-stranded DNA is not that stable. Um, so this whole group of viruses um, are uh, intriguing in and of themselves. They have a, their genome is made out of one strand of DNA. So the first thing that happens is the host cell turns it into double-stranded DNA as soon as it gets into the host cell. So these two have DNA genomes. Um, these have uh, RNA genomes. But notice one type of virus to group three, they have genes made out of double-stranded RNA. And if you remember your general biology, it's like that not cells don't do that, right? Double-stranded RNA, no, no, no. Sing, RNA is single-stranded. It's one of those features that distinguishes those two types of nucleic acid. Nope. They have double-stranded, double-helical RNA. That's what those viruses do. Interesting. Um, and then we have single-stranded RNA, two different types, uh, plus sense, which is essentially an R, a messenger RNA molecule. And then these group, this would be an antisense RNA. So these guys have to be turned into messenger RNA um, before they can be used. And what I want to say is that all three of these types of viruses had to invent their own enzyme to make copies of their RNA genomes, so to replicate their genomes. So remember, DNA replication and DNA transcription are two separate chemical biological events. Um, these guys had to invent a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which means it can use RNA to make more RNA. Because remember, the central dogma says DNA is used to make RNA in cells, in all living cells that we know of at this point. So these viruses had to invent their own enzyme to enable that, which they did and which they carry with them into the cells that they invade so that the cells they invade know what to do with their genes. That's what the adaptation is. And then moving on to groups six and seven, um, these are called retroviruses because, not because they're walking around looking like they're from the 50s, uh, but because they are able to, they have, this one has an RNA genome and it, it reverse transcribes, meaning it uses RNA as the template to produce double-stranded DNA. So reverse transcription makes 
double-stranded DNA out of an RNA genome. And this group, which includes hepatitis, the hepatitis virus, hepatitis B, by the way, um, it starts with a double-stranded DNA genome, makes an RNA that is reverse transcribed back into um, DNA. So here's another fun fact, which we will discuss at a point in the future, but um, those, when you have double-stranded DNA, so this group, this group, this group, double-stranded DNA will go find areas where there is sequence homology, meaning where the order of nucleotides matches up, and they will insert themselves or integrate into the genome of the host cell, where they can remain integrated for days, weeks, years, months, decades, millennia, forever, um, as uh, stable elements, stable genetic elements within um, the cell's genome. So little fun fact, which we'll talk about more later going forward, but our DNA in our cells has, we are littered with uh, DNA sequences from reverse transcription. So we have what are referred to as, we have our own sets of these retroviruses called endogenous retroviruses. We have sequences of retroviruses inserted into our cells DNA. So we are, you know, they are part of our genome uh, as well. At, at, you know, that would be included in our genome, right? So our own genome would include those retroviral sequences and other sequences that we don't really know what the origins are, but we know that they're there. So that, that'll be a fun talk later when we get to the point of talking about genetics. Okay, so that's the Baltimore classification system. And then I just want to also bring up that um, there is also the International Taxonomy on the uh, International Committee on the for the Taxonomy of Viruses, or ICTV, uh, which views them as maybe they're not they're not you know alive per se, but they certainly we need to embrace them as part of our taxonomy, as part of the taxonomy of life. Maybe they're not alive per se; they don't follow all the rules but we should treat them uh, with the due respect uh, of living things that we do, would do with everything else. So we're gonna classify them the same way that we would um, you know, any other group of living things. So that's the ICTV approach. Um, if you are interested in that, it, actually, if you just go to this link, you could listen in great detail, very passionately, why um, the, this particular you know, kind of uh, focus or uh, group thinks that viruses should be have their own have a taxonomy that is like equivalent or similar to that of other forms of life. Um, but you know the big picture is that basically taxonomy, um, you know, keep it consistent. So you know the kingdom, phylum, uh, class, order, all the way down to genus and species. So they do that with viruses too. So there are these two separate, there's the taxonomy of viruses, and then there is the Baltimore classification. So realize that the names of viruses come from this taxonomy, but unfortunately many viruses were named before the taxonomy occurred. And so, um, you know, viruses, what I'm trying to say is that viruses may actually have more than one name. I'll give you an example uh, later on in a minute. Okay, so order is the highest uh, taxon, the taxon, right? The broadest grouping is the order. And in the naming system for viruses, uh, the order ends with this uh, suffix virales, right? So mononego virales are um, viruses that have a negative RNA genome, one strand of it. And then um, families and subfamily names end in either viridae or virinae, uh, right? So the herpes, viridae, um, would be an example, those are the herpes viruses. And then, you know, taking, I'll just use human herpes viruses as, as an example. So the family of herpes viruses is herpes viridae. Um, the genus would be herpes virus, uh, human herpes virus, because many other species have herpes viruses too. So in other words, the genus of something like uh, the virus, the Epstein-Barr virus would be human herpes virus. And then it's, in this newer taxonomy, it's called human herpes virus 4. But who calls it that other than virologists because your basic doctor will call it Epstein-Barr virus or will call it herpes simplex virus. That's 
human herpes virus one and two. Um, or we'll call it cytomegalovirus, that is human herpes virus five. So that it's, like I said, so there's a bit of confusion as all of this uh, evolves out, where both the old names and sort of this new taxonomy are, try, are fighting with each other to try to win. But I'm gonna tell you on the medical sense, I don't think that in medicine, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, will always be <laughs> EBV, all right? Although interesting, so newly discovered ones like human herpes virus six, um, they call HHV six. So we have all the classically named uh, viruses and then we have HHV six, HHV seven, HHV eight um, to go with. So basically it's kind of, it's very confusing. So if you really wanna know what kind of virus you're dealing with, you have to you know, go back and look at a viral database to try to figure out what, um, you know, what exactly it is you're talking about there. And then just to add to the whole deal of this group that says, oh, we're all living things and viruses should be included in that, they hold bacteriophage, viruses that infect bacteria to be a whole different thing. Not fair, but that's besides the fact. So the point being, ugh, this is hard. I like the Baltimore classification system. I'm not discriminating against virus. I kind of see that they are, you know, so they don't meet the definition that we, we imparted to life, but they certainly um, do lots of good stuff or on their own without um, us telling them anything. They just do it differently. So, um, but I do prefer the Baltimore classification because it's pretty straightforward. It's about the molecules, it's about the process, end of story. Okay, so guess what? So we have a human microbiome, we have a human mycobiome, and we have a human viral. And we're just beginning to talk about that uh, because again, viruses have fallen into the category of dangerous infectious particles that cause diseases. Their appreciation as perhaps doing other things has been um, neglected. And a characterization of what viruses are present in healthy people um, is at, you know, just unknown at this point. So research is starting to, um, you know, we're starting to look at viruses the way, in a, a categorical way, the way we did it with bacteria. Though then we started with myco, um, you know, the, the fungi, and now we're moving into viruses, all right? And I really believe that this is going to be perhaps the most interesting of all of the, those different types of ohms that we can look at. So I just, to you know, kind of finish up here, looking at um, research done on the human ecosystem and all of our various symbionts. So you'll notice starting um, you know, about 2006, that's what I said, you know, the human microbiome project got its beginnings in 2003, four, five. The first data started to emerge 2006, um, 2007. So notice, you know, published peer-reviewed scientific papers over um, this, this roughly 10 year period with microbiome in the title is the dark purple, mycobiome, meaning our fungal inhabitants in this turquoise, and then virome in this lighter uh, green color. So notice, you know, we started off really strong and the microbiome, the concept of microbiome took off, lots of publications on that. Here's why, because there was a huge NIH funded, actually a global initiative to determine the sequence of the microbiome. So tons and tons of money and laboratories got really invested in understanding the human microbiome, the bacterial inhabitants. And then, you know, realize, oop, you know, there's more than just bacteria present here and maybe we should start looking at these others. So, you know, the first paper showed up in 2010. So the first research didn't start until just 10 years ago. And even now, um, you know, we don't have that much going on. So, and here's the part, I don't know if this makes me sad, but the microbiome, so, you know, there's, there hasn't been much interest in our fungal inhabitants. So what's up with that? Why don't we care about the fungi? They're fellow eukaryotes. Uh, the virome has become of more interest, even though, again, bacteria are still the major um, focus of research um, when it comes to the, 
what people can get funding for and what they can do in their laboratories. And uh, we'll have to see what the next several years bring. So that is a summary of what we know about the diversity of different types of uh, life forms based on those two cell plans of prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, and then the acellular viruses. Um, so putting all that together, um, is that all there is to life? And I'm saying probably not, but that's the end of this lecture. So thanks very much.